criteria. So without further ado, uh, Liz Thomas. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, one who is over all, through all, and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried ab about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of, of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Thank you, Liz. And Lord, we thank you for your words and, and your forgiveness that you, you have forgiven us. And so may we receive this and grant it to others and help them to see uh, that they have been forgiven and, and to not only find their way back to you, but grow uh, in likeness uh, with you and, and in your mission. Amen. All right, kids, you can head on out this direction. Thank you for being so patient and hanging with us so long. Always a pleasure to have you around and always a pleasure to see so many of you trucking out through that door. And so Lord, we thank you for each and every one of these kids. I uh, will not even try to catch up on all the names of all the ones that ran out the door, um, but we thank you for their presence here, Lord, and we pray that we would be a church that continues to embody uh, your love for them. Uh, we read Deuteronomy 6 and the importance of generation after generation after generation of teaching. We pray that we would be uh, a church that does this. Amen. Uh, flour. Sugar. Butter. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who's on board? Uh, depending on, on the application, baking soda, baking powder, don't confuse them, but uh, be pretty ha handy to have those around. Uh, anybody know where we're going? Chocolate chip cookies. Uh, we could be doing maybe some chocolate chip cake. We got a little salt. 
we got we got some sprinkles because uh, that's an important thing in in the Gary household. I've been told um, this is my contribution to the whole in deal. Dark chocolate, always the dark chocolate, always the dark chocolate, and uh, eggs. Tough to carry eggs in a crate. Yeah, there we go. Uh, what's the most important part of chocolate chip cookies or or cake? The chocolate. Okay, the chocolate chips. Right? Yeah, yeah. I was like. Yeah. I don't need no eggs. I don't need no flour. Just give me the chocolate chips and nobody gets hurt, right? Uh, dark chocolate? Or just, somebody said chocolate chips over here. Is that, was that Emma? Who was that? Oh, that was Verna. Yeah. So dark chocolate, is that semi-sweet? Oh, well, okay. Well, I guess I'll keep them up here then. Um, all right. <laughs> I mean, I just don't want to go to waste, you know? Um, but but what, like, what's the most, and, you know, what's the most important part? Eating them, yes, very good. But but then, so we but but what happens if we don't have the flour? Yeah, we're gonna have kind of some soup, right? We're gonna have like scrambled egg chocolate thing, and that's gonna be a little odd. Oh, what happens if we don't have the sugar? The consistency isn't gonna be right, right? It's gonna be a little bit bland. Yeah, it's gonna be kind of odd. If we don't have the butter, it's not gonna rise right. It's gonna have like a weird texture. What happens if we don't cook them? You could get salmonella, or you could just, you know, kind of be like Rocky and just drink the eggs, whatever else. No big deal. Right? This is like, I mean, you know, and let's be honest. Cookie dough uncooked is almost better than cooked cookie dough. Uh, <laughs> and have you had it in ice cream? It's delicious. Um, I, okay, but, but the, what, what we see here is that while each of these have some, some importance and some value on their own, when you put them together and you subject them to, to some heat and some, and some kind of uh, uh, some form, like all of a sudden things get really good. Like you got something, as, as Glenn said, like you can invite people to the table for something like that. And that's like part of the, the important, that's the fun part is that we, we get to uh, partake of this together. And so one of the things that Paul is driving at within the book of Ephesians, so a little bit of background. So uh, there's this church in a town called Ephesus, and we, we went really deep on this a few years ago. I'm not going to do that today. Uh, but Paul is in prison. He's writing a letter back to this church to encourage them because they're, they're doing it well. It's one of the few churches in the New Testament uh, that, that aren't really having any big catastrophic problems. So Paul is writing this letter, encouraging them about how to go on. And so the, so the first three chapters is talking about how awesome God is and, and just the love of, that Jesus has for them and they have for him and, and what that means for them. And then in, in chapter four, he kind of turns and he's going to talk about, okay, how do we now uh, walk this out? And what does it look like to disciple those around us? And this is the question that uh, Nehemiah 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 kind of raised for us, right? That's been kind of the struggle as we've been going through Ezra and Nehemiah as we just see this continual like, Oh, under Zerubbabel, right? You got these people that pioneer and they go and they leave. They, this first exile out of Babylon, they're going to go back and they're going to start this thing and it's going to be really awesome. Has anyone ever been a part of something that's brand new and, and, and you're just kind of like figuring out how things go and you just go, I'm not really sure how it's going to work. I'm just going to go. Anybody? Okay, that's like Zerubbabel is kind of your guy, right? If you're like from Ezra, <laughs> Gretchen and Lucre. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, you know, and and uh, if you don't know anything about Luke, he's a serial entrepreneur. Um, and uh, and and Gretchen helps keep things organized and structured, right? And so, and we need that, right? Because if you just have Zerubbabel, then like you're just going to be people that are going, and they're not really sure what they're going to do. And so, then what does the Lord do in in, in in eight through twelve of Ezra? He sends Ezra, and he says, "I'm going to we're going to study, we're going to do, we're going to teach." Ezra brings some like here's what we're doing and clarifies why they're going the way that they're going and, and what is supposed to happen. And then, but there's, the, it's just not just this teaching, it's not this head thing, and it's got to be this heart thing, and the people aren't really understanding it. And so Nehemiah comes along, and he's like, really, y'all? 14 years? Like, we sent you the lumber. Finish the building. And he gets, goes crazy, and in 52 days, they finish what they couldn't do in the previous 14 years, right? Does that take a little bit of talent? Does that take a little bit of like drive and some gusto and the ability to kind of motivate others? Okay, so we see that, that if, if Nehemiah were to have come first, what would that have been like? That would have been a lot of barking orders and a lot of impatience, right? Like there needed to be some foundation there. And if Zerubbabel would have come at the end, like, well, I mean, he wouldn't have come because like, he, he would have been doing something else. Okay, and so there's, there, there's these different facets of, of the faith, and we need these different types of, of leaders, and we need other people to be involved. And so to raise these questions of, of uh, you know, why, why is it that, 
that Nehemiah, that Ezra and Nehemiah are so con- are so concerned with the community and the rebuilding of the community? Why are they so concerned with the rebuilding of the altar and the temple and the structures and the rhythms that we participate in when we when when those are constructed? Why why is Nehemiah so bent on on making this wall when when we read in scriptures and even some of the prophets uh, before him that say, look, there's someday we're going to go to a city that doesn't need a wall. You're not going to have to learn how to hang a door because we're not going to need them anymore. And so why, why are these here? Well, it, it comes back to, and, and, and Paul addresses this and helps us to see this in light of the gospel because of, of who the Lord says that we are. And, and, and so it gets back to these fundamental questions of it's, it's not about, about your, your gifting or your personality or your preferences, but it's, it's about Christ. It's about who we are as people. It's that that you, uh, Exodus 19 says that you are a treasured possession, right? And that we've been set apart. Why? So that we have a blessing to the world around us. Okay, so it's not set apart going, oh, check out what I did. And Ephesians 2 is going to address it. It's like, no, because nobody gets to boast. We don't get to go, oh, I have this, I I get, you know, Zerubbabel can't be like, hey, check me out, I'm awesome, I pioneered this thing. And Ezra can't get up and be like, oh, I'm awesome because I'm a great teacher. And Nehemiah can't get up and say, hey, check me out, I'm a great builder. Right, because all those are things that they were equipped by God to be able to do. And so the, the question becomes, how do we then work together in these things? And so uh, last week we, we, we went and we, we kind of got big picture. And we talked about how the freedom that we have, the mercy that we've been given by a God who is ready to forgive. Right, And we had Katie and Chad came up here and they kind of faced off with, who is leading the crew over here? I think it was, was it Gwen? Right, yeah, so, like, so we're going to have this kind of that like West Side Story style, you know, showdown we saw that there were only two verses in chapter nine that 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 kind of that mourned sin right but there were nine other ones that talked about the greatness of god and then there are like 20 other ones that talk about what happens when when god and our sin collide and that and that that, then that we receive forgiveness and he grants mercy and grace and then we work together in the manifestation and display of the kingdom right and so and so what we want to do is take some time to go okay well now what does that look like on a really practical level what does that look like brass tacks? And how do we, how do we begin to walk that out? Because we also discovered last week, and, and, and we think about this, and as we look at, at the way and what we talk about here at Community Thoughts, what's, what's something that happens? Right? Does anybody else get tripped up where you're like, I, I want to serve, but I don't know how? Right? I mean, imagine being, being somebody who'd, who'd grown up in exile. You're back in Jerusalem. Ezra and Nehemiah are doing, bringing about all these reforms, and you're going, I, I want to participate, but, but my mind is so, is so kind of wrapped up with, and, and, and I need to be renewed because I'm, I'm so caught up in, in, in Babylonian thinking and thinking of the world that I just can't quite think gospel yet. I just don't really know how to enact this yet. Anybody else, or am I the only one that struggled with that? Okay, so at least one other person. Good. Um, and so Paul's going to address this. And he says, okay, so here, as a result of all these things, as a result of, of you, you are a child of God. Okay, and so, um, excuse me. <coughs> couldn't, couldn't hit the mute button fast enough. Um, as a result that you're a child of God, that is now your primary identity. So whether you're introverted or you're extroverted, whether you're whatever four-letter combination on your Myers-Briggs, whatever number you are on your Enneagram, no matter what title you hold at work or whatever title you hold that's not at work, those are all secondary theater. Those are all secondary identities. Those are all secondary ways of thinking about who we are that are subject to and are, and are, are just a way that we play out the fact that we are a son or a daughter if we are in Christ. Now, if you're, if you're not a child of God, then, yeah, the, 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 that's a separate conversation altogether. Okay, but if, if you're a child of God, then all of a sudden these various things become conduits through which we show the grace and the mercy of God and invite others to participate in the kingdom, right? And so no longer is, 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 is my, my whatever four-letter Myers-Briggs that I have, that it, we, we become dynamic. Right? We're not static. Like so often you hear people and they go, Well, I'm this, therefore I do this. 
You know, so be like, I'm an Enneagram, whatever your number is, therefore I do these things. Or I'm a whatever Myers-Briggs, therefore I do these things. Or I'm, you know, introverted or extroverted, therefore I do these things. Or, you know, pick whatever it is, the do, you know, the, the various animal, per- all these things. And we go, I, I do this and I, I'm this, therefore I do that. And Paul's like, no, you're a child of God. Therefore, walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you've been called with humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I love that. Like, what are you, what are you eager about? Like, if you think about, like, what are the things that you, like, kind of raise anxiety within you or, like, you know, kind of get you psyched up and motivated? Like, what are the things? Is it, is it, e- is it, is it an eagerness to maintain, <laughs> to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? That's what Jesus said. Hey, this is this is what I want you to be eager about. And he, and he continues on. So this whole thing, Paul's just gonna unity, unity. I think it's like eleven times in the next ten verses. He can talk about one, one, one. I want you to be one. I want you to be one. I want you to be one. Right. This is even Jesus' prayer for us. He says, "Hey, the way that me, Dad, and and the Spirit, and and me, I want them to experience what we've got, and that we can all be in this together, and that we'd all be one." And then, and then the last part of Ephesians uh, 4, 12 through 16, is he's going to talk about maturity. And it raises this question, right? And something we think about a lot here is we go, okay, is it just about, and we talk about this, like, what we, we walk in grace, but then what else do we do? We grow in our faith, right? So it's not something that we just hang and we just stay in this, but it's something that we actually grow. We're, we're to mature, right? We, we saw all those little kids head out the door, right? Is it good that they can walk on their own power? It's kind of a cool thing, right? Kind of cool that like most of us get to do that, right? And and and, and we develop that. Like, w- would we look like and and do those those kids? Right, they're going to grow in their ability to do things, and, and that's what we want, right? We want them to grow and mature. We want them to grow up. That's kind of the the goal. And wh- and the marks of maturity are are hundred percent trust in Jesus. And so what? And, and so what's the conduit through which we get unity with Jesus and maturity in the faith? It's right there in chapter 10. There's, there's this gift that, that Jesus lives, leaves us. He, says, he who descended is one who also ascended far above that he might fill all things. And he gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up the body of Christ until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so he wants you to be like Jesus. How do we do that? He says, well, I've given you apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Now, there's, there's a lot of garbage out there about these five uh, like callings, giftings, these five words, and, and some just kind of blatant silliness. And so um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. I'd rather just spend time on the good part. But let's just dispel, um, again, because sometimes people can go, oh, I'm, I, th- they'll self-proclaim. Like I always get little nervous about people that like self-proclaim some sort of title especially when they want to like attach some kind of biblical thing to it like oh i'm an apostle and therefore like this like okay well i just don't think you're supposed to like beat people over the head with a club to get your way that just doesn't sound christ-like to me i just don't see jesus doing that right but we can but so so what i want to do i want to be careful here and talk about like there's there is still apostolic gifting and movement and there are apostolic works and there's there's some positions so i want to talk a little bit about what these terms mean and how we can start to think about them uh, in a way that helps us to think about equipping the saints to growing in maturity. So I'm just going to break down these, these, uh, uh, these, these words a little bit, and then we'll talk about um, what that means. Um, so he gave apostles. Okay? Uh, an apostle is, uh, is, is one who's, who's just rooted in, in this idea of go. Um, this is a term that's used throughout ancient Near Eastern literature. Uh, I find an interesting thing about apostles is they were always sent by someone. It was always, it, they were always commissioned out. And these are the people that within the church, they're, they're, they're the ones who are like, let's go out. They're very mission focused, right? And so in scriptures, we see people like Jesus. It's very apostolic, right? He goes. He's going to go out and he's going to urge others to go out. And they're constantly looking for ways that, that, that the church, and we can explore the way, like how do we bring the church into new, new places and, and, and new ways? Uh, Paul is like this. And then here, uh, you think about people like Sarah Dubrowski, 
because this, this is Sean Hotman from the room. These are people that are going, okay, how do we take this gospel message of the gathered people, and as we scatter out, how do we think about ways that we can get other people uh, in front of and getting face-to-face with Jesus in ways that they might not have in years past? Okay, so these are going to be like intuitive in a minute. They're going to try to go out and they're going to do these things. And then you have the, these people like prophets. And so the prophet is really, really concerned with the heart of God. Their big question is why. They, they want to know like how do, we, how do we integrate the faith? Why, how, what does it look like to, to take the heart of God and, and to know God deeply and, and, and radically and then, and then make that happen within our lives? And so you got people like Jesus who that, I mean, he is the, the great prophet, right? And you have people like Jeremiah who are constantly calling people to repentance. And so here, in, in, like, in the room, if you've ever had like, conversations with, with, like, Benjamin or with Liz Kaufman, it's like, they're going to ask you questions. They're going to be very concerned about, like, okay, how do we take, like, what are God's concerns and how do we actually carry them out? What is this going to look like? And so they're going to be concerned with, with justice and, and with the heart of God and knowing God deeply. And then you have these people that are evangelists. Okay, and so Jesus is this great evangelist. Let's, let's talk about this for a second. Uh, twice in Jesus' ministry, he threw a pop-up restaurant party without any social media and without a kitchen that had more than 5,000 people. Think about that. I mean, 5,000 people, right? Like, I was dialoguing with Matt Annan about this, and he and his brother Marty just sent me a, a message that he, uh, that he and his brother had had. And basically, if you go to the woods, here in town, that would take you five out. Matt's conservative estimate is like, oh yeah, five hours, bare minimum, just to serve the food. Just to serve the pop-up dinner. Like, I don't know what the biggest pop-up meal that has ever happened, but I, I, Jesus has got to be close. Doesn't even have a kitchen. <laughs> awesome. So these are people that are going to gather a crowd. These are people that are going, hey, I want you to be a part of this. You're going to be constantly looking around like they're the people in the room that are going, hey, I've never met you yet. Hey, who are, who are you? Hey, let's come to this thing. Okay, and so the evangelists are, the, are these people, and they, they, they're going to go out, and they just want to tell people about who Jesus is. They want to see more people coming around. They're gonna, their mission is to seek and to save, and they're gathering people around that's going to look like Jesus. Yeah, Philip the Evangelist in Acts 8. This is like the Luke Reckies of the world who are just like going around. There's like, oh, yeah, who are these people? How do we, how do we get them? Have you been spending time with, with uh, like Leah Gary? Like she's going to tell you about all the things that she's really excited about, and she's going to gather people around. That's what this looks like. You got shepherds. Now I want to be be clear. Okay, this word shepherd, uh, past. Like if you have the NIV, I think it just says pastors, and, and so this word kind of gets broken up into different ways. And sometimes it says shepherds and teachers, and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, there, there's two functions here that I want to just talk about. So you have shepherds. You have Jesus. He's the good shepherd. You got the apostle John, right? I mean, you read in, in his later epistles, and he just talks about love, and, and he's just gently guiding people along. Um, and th- if you look around the room, this is like, you know, if you ever sit in, like, their, their primary question is going to be like, hey, are you okay? Like, h- how, how are you doing really? W- what's really going on within you? And so if you, like, sit very long with someone like Kelly Smith or, or Nick Hoffman, like, that's what they're going to do. They're going to sit there, are, okay, how are you? And, and they're just going to be qu- just super concerned about caring for you and, and, and just making sure that you know that you are loved. And then teacher. Like, then you got Jesus, right? I mean, what a great teacher. Can anybody, like, teach better than Jesus does? Okay, and in the scriptures, this is Ezra, right? Like, to study, to do, and to teach. Like, that's, that, that's Ezra's, Ezra's deal. Uh, study, teach, do. Okay, I mean, this is, uh, as, as Scott just demonstrated for us, he took what I said in, in three to four hours, and he reduced it down into one minute. Uh, let's all thank Scott. Um, but it's also like Leah Schiller. Like if you spend time with Leah, like her, she's always thinking about and really helps me to think about, okay, okay how do we communicate this an idea that's in a way that's going to be helpful for other people? And how do we break it down? So you think about like the various curriculums that she's, she's found or even have written for the kids just to help it to be really simple to go, okay, how, how do we take this message and how do we reduce it down into, into bite-sized chunks so that people can, can, can eat and they can feast on this and they can know? Okay, and so that's what, so... So when we think about kind of this, this, big, this big picture, and we go, okay, how do we, how do we move from, you know, how do, how do we go from, from, from the, the nine verses over here to the, to the two verses about sin here to, to collaborating with God in those 20 verses at the end of, of Ezra 9, and we go, f- or Nehemiah 9, and we go Nehemiah 10, 11, and 12, and the way that the people are participating, well, we start to ask these, we start to look at this, and we go, okay, a- a- am I wired more toward go? Like, am, is, is the primary like way that I look at, at, at how we do church life and, and the way that like what Jesus has set me free to do, is it to go? Do I have kind of an apostolic bent? 
Or, or maybe I'm like just really concerned with a question of why and, and knowing God more and, and, and caring deeply for the causes uh, of, that, that Jesus is, is passionate about and for, for justice. Maybe I have more of a prophetic bent to me. Or, or do we think to ourselves like, well, you got to get people together. Yeah, we want to like get every, make sure everybody can come to the party. We're going to build the biggest table that we can, and we're going to invite all of our friends because it's going to be epic and awesome. But maybe you have some like evangelistic tendencies. And maybe like when, when you're at that group and you're in that part, like maybe the one that like pulls the people aside and says, hey, tell me, how, how's it really going? Because this is what I see. I see the way that, that when, you, when you look at, at him or her or when this thing gets mentioned, that there's this shift. Something's going on here. What, what, tell me more about that. Good or bad, right? You got the shepherd in your heart. And you got some people that are just going, hey, like, we just, it's more helpful to understand the word. And so they're just thinking about, the, you know, they spend a lot of time meditating on the word and how do we break this down and share it in a way that's helpful. And so what is Paul exemplifying here? What are we seeing within this one another? And what are we seeing within these various gifts? Well, as we said before, the Lord has shown great when his people participate. The Lord has shown great when his people participate. And uh, sadly, often, as we, we discussed this a little bit last week, sadly, w- we've kind of reduced the mission of the church to having a really good Sunday morning production, which is just like a horribly, like, who does that really help? Like, that fuels the ego of a few people, but man, just wildly not helpful. And, and it's an underdeveloped idea of what the faith is to be, right? Like, I'm glad that we all get to come together and I hope that what I say up here and, and what, what we do up here is, is helpful for, for us and for the cause of, of Jesus. Um, but man, like what a bummer if, you, if you're just like, hey, I don't really, pl- like I don't play music and I don't really want to talk in front of people and I don't really feel like running the computer and, and I'm just frankly not very good with kids. Uh, like wouldn't it be a bummer if, if Sunday morning was the high point and like the only metric that we had for what loving God with? Like how many people would, would be left outside? A lot, right? Fortunately, the apo- like the, these giftings, these wirings, if you are apostolic in nature, if you have prophetic tendencies, if you are evangelistic, if you have the shepherd's heart, if you have a teacher's competency, you know where you can take that? Everywhere. There's nowhere where you can go nowhere where you can be where those aren't needed where those aren't helpful there's nowhere where you can go and there's no movement within the faith that that happens without all five like when all five of these are present because who who is the common denominator when we went through and, and we and we when i listed off those names who is present in each one of those each one of those words jesus Right? And so what happens if we as a church, as we begin to re- reflect the image of God in which we've been created, what happens when, if, if, if you have a church that's, that's built around about going out and seeking new ways to try to, to understand and help people to see Jesus more clearly? And, and what if you had a church that also was that upheld and, and made sure that those who cared deeply about the, uh, about the things that God w- cared about and that they knew God on a, on a deep and intimate way, what if they also had a say at the table? And what if, if someone who was evangelistic and say, yeah, we're going to gather as many people together as we can and we're going to go and we're gonna tell everybody about who Jesus is? What happens if, if the church had that? And then what at the same time it was rooted in, in just this like deep shepherd's heart that the, that the people would know that they're loved and that they're cared for by God. And then they would be taught and they'd be taught not just about God, but then even how to teach others about God. What would happen if all five of those were valued and all five of those were present at the table? Then does Sunday morning, like is Sunday morning then like the thing? Or is, is Jesus every day the thing? Right? And so then, and like this just gets to be a time that we celebrate the presence of all five of those things. This is a time that we get to celebrate the fact that Jesus is king, that, that, he, has, that he has gone before us and he invites us to come along with it, that he invites us into a deep and profound truth and that we get to go and all the things that he, that he says that he's passionate, we get to like participate in those and we get to eradicate injustice in the world. Right? Like we don't need, that doesn't need to be legislated out. That needs to be loved out. And we get to participate in that, not be by our own power, but because of what Jesus has done and is in continue to do in and through us. And then we go out and we get to proclaim this message to all these people around. And then the people that are broken and are hurting and are, and are growing get to be done so like and, and shepherded. And then they get to be taught. 
how great is he? Because the Lord has shown great in his people participate. And so why is this important? Why, why are we taking this time to kind of do a little bit more of this, um, you know, we kind of went from last week, big picture, to something that's really practical this week. Well, we talk about it each week, right? We talk about how we gather in grace, walk, you know, we grow in our faith and get into groups and we explore our gifts. And I'd say that one of the things that, that, that I think is going to be imperative for us moving forward and one of the things that we've struggled to do in the past is to help people understand their gifts. Right? And so, like, if, if this is the only way that we get to gather together and participate, um, and, or maybe in, in some of our, our weekly small groups, I think some people, and I just wonder, if, if, if is some of this because we don't understand who we are and what we're to do in light of the fact that, that we're a child of God? And so if we're sons and we're daughters, like how, do we, like, how do we move forward? And if we've only ever seen somebody get up in front and teach, and we go, well, I don't teach, so therefore, like, why, like, what do I do? That can be confusing. And so what I w- hope that we're able to do, and, and I, th- I want to just to start the conversation today, but for us to explore our gifts, because the gospel call, like, sets us free and then calls us to participate. And then what Paul does here is he gives us language and understanding that we can come together and we can work together. Because here's the cool thing. Okay, if there's a problem in the world, like how do, do we, how do we solve it? It's often reactionary, right? Like we're either going to like respond out of fear or at best we're going to have some sort of like goal-driven response to something that's going on in the world. Jesus is like, hey, what if we just started with, with the vision that like you're a child of God and that I dwell within you and you get to participate in the redemptive work that I'm doing in the world because I've set you free by the power of the gospel. And so no longer do we look at, at, at these problems of like, oh, how are we going to do this? But we get to go in and go, oh, hey, I, 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 we know what to do here. Like, oh, we need someone to go. We're like, yeah, like, hey, Sean, like, how do, how do we think about how to get these people, like, how, how, like not necessarily get them through the door, evangelist style. But like, Sean, how, how do we think about how to get, like, bring the church to the people? How do we sort of think about that? And we get to go around, we get to look at, at the, w- other, the ways that other people are gifted, and we go, okay, ha- tell me, how does this work out better, Right? And so we respond, we don't, resp- we don't react to the problems of the world, but we respond to what Jesus is doing in and through us. Um, really quickly, what happens if we don't do this? We don't clearly, um, uh, if, if a- any one of these, these traits were to run wild and unfettered, if we were to be static, it's like we can see um, the way that this can be, this can sow discord, um, and it creates this, this, peck, this like false pecking order. Right? So an apostle, if left unfettered, it's just going to go all the time, and it's always going to show like go, 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 and they're going to go fifty, mi- 50 different places in two different minutes, and nobody's going to be able to follow. They become they become domineering. Prophet can be disrespectful and move from from uh, um, from conviction to critique. Evangelists become highly driven, and just more it all becomes about getting more people, but it becomes less and less about developing people into a deep and profound love of Jesus. Shepherds can can drown in, in the problems of others, having so many things to because they're not moving people from love to and being able to show how to love others. And teachers can become dogmatic in choosing being right over relationship. And so fortunately, Paul gives us some some language and some understanding about what we're, what we're to do. So what do we do as a result of, of of these various giftings and 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 what the Lord has given us? the first verb that he gives us in in chapter one, or in in verse 1 I urge you to walk I urge you to walk not run and not sit I urge you to walk probably right around the speed of a bide right around the speed of a bide I want you to walk in a manner that's worthy of your calling someone once said I, I, may the way of your being match the truth of your being May what is true about you inform the way that you exist. And, and, and may the way that you exist show others what is true about you. So just walk in a manner that's worthy of your calling. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity that we have in the Spirit. And it allows for, for dynamics, right? 
it allows us to be flexible. It allows us to affirm and uphold and make space for the others to have room at the table uh, for their gifting. And so what does it look like for us as a church if we actually get to affirm one another's gifting and we, we aren't threatened by one another's gifting? Okay, so like I have these tendencies to like go and I want to go and I want to see uh, different ways. I want to like, I've got a, like I've a, I have a page in the back of my journal that's just called Mike's Ideas. I was talking to my brother, like my brother and I think a lot alike, we look a lot alike, and we're having a conversation one day, and he was just like, calm down, buddy, <laughs> like, choose one, and that was good advice that was given, I remember as a young pastor, I was, when, I, when I first started here, I was like, oh, we got all these things that we could do in this building, where we could do like food carts and venues and this and that and whatever else, and someone's like, hey, what if you were just like shepherd of the people, and I was like, oh, good call, right, and so if I don't have those people in my life, like, I can run amok and go all over the place. And, and transversely, I can go to the opposite direction where if I'm just spending time like only shepherding people, but I'm not actually calling them to live life in light of the truth, to go out and to proclaim the gospel, to know Jesus deeply, and to actually go. Like now it's like a it's like a hospital that has a physical therapy wing that just keeps growing because they never graduate anybody else. Right? And so there's a process and there's a dynamicness to this that we're invited to participate in. And so what does it look like when we get to affirm one another? And, and we get to invite others to the table. Is this something that we see often in the world? Where we look and we actually celebrate how God has made somebody else? Like I say this a lot, like I'm really glad for people like, like Ethan and like Benjamin. It's like I just don't do money well, and they do. And so I, like, I need them around. And, and so when they're like, oh, yeah, we're interested in helping out in finance, I was like, oh, thank God. Because <laughs> if we leave this to myself, like, this is not going to be good. This is not good. Right? But, like, it just makes sense for them. Like, you just talk to them and just, like, it's n- they don't even think about it. They're just like, oh, yeah, this is how it all figures out. And so what does it look like in the world when we get to affirm others' differences and others' gifts? And be like, oh, yeah, can you believe how awesome it is? Like, someone can be like, oh, Mike, but, like, you're bad at that. Like, yeah, I am. But that's okay. Like, I don't need to be good at it because Benjamin is, and he's got my six. It's cool. Right? And so how do we then affirm other people? Like, I mean, who can gather a crowd like Andrew Dirks? Like, if you have not been invited to one of Andrew Dirks' shows, like, how did you do it? Like, because, I mean, it's just like flyers all over the place. Like, hey, come to my show. Like, I don't even, like, this is a long number, right? And it's great. And, and that's, like, an awesome thing. And, like, and what happens when we started to, like, celebrate, people were, you know, like, come, people come around, like, oh, it's like, tell me about your church. Like, oh, man, we've got these, like, these just these tender, these tender folk that can just sit and, they'll, like, they'll just sit with you patiently. And they'll just listen, and, and they'll help you process through and, and, and help you to see that you're loved and that you're cared for. I mean, like, do we see that often in other parts of the world, in other parts of our lives? Like, come on, we're, we get to demonstrate this. And, and we get to affirm it and, and send people out. And all of a sudden, we become this, this like, what does it look like? When, and how does it begin to change the world around us when, when we, can, we can affirm it? We can kind of go with those people, right? And if, and if we do this in humility, and we don't just go, I'm the prophet, therefore we all need to know, like, what's going on? It's like, dude, nobody wants to follow that guy or gal. But we want people that, that will ask those questions and bring us in deeper and further understanding and relationship with God. Right? And that, that isn't something that we just do on Sunday morning. This is us all of a sudden, like, what does this happen when, when we do this, like, Monday at lunch? And we do this Wednesday at breakfast. And we do this Friday at happy hour. And we do this Saturday at brunch. And these rhythms and these, these various ways of, of looking at the world begin to continue to inform how we interact with the world around us. What does this do and how does it begin to shape us as individuals and as a church? when we can acknowledge the, the areas of our life where, where we are weak and where we do need help. And, and then we get others around us that can help us in that and we can actually grow. Because it isn't like, Paul isn't saying like, oh, if, if you're an apostle, like just be an apostle. You don't have to, because we saw that Jesus is, is the, the great example of all of these. And, it, and, if, and if that's a part of being who Jesus is and, and walking and becoming like Jesus is having these various facets all present within us. And if we go, oh, I, I'm not a shepherd, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not a prophet, I'm not an apostle, I, I, I can't do that. And I just say, why? Like, what, what's, what's stopping you? And, 
and what's that conversation with the Lord like? So I don't think the Lord's just like, oh, I, I don't ever want you to go. I don't ever want, like, I don't think he's just like, oh, I just want you like four to five. Because I think that what he talks about in the, in the rest of, of, or Paul talks about in the rest of, of four, to walk in the manner of, of what's worthy of the calling, because we're members one of another, we, we need all of this. We need everyone to come together on this so that we can demonstrate and walk this out and to grow and become more and more like Jesus. Right? Like, I need people to challenge me to go. I need people to challenge me to know Jesus deeper. I need people to challenge me to gather people around to proclaim the gospel. I need people to, to help me to understand to, to how to shepherd and how to be careful and caring with other souls. I need people to help me to teach more clearly. And so I need others around us to help us to do this. Because if we don't do this, I'd argue that we don't become mature and become who we've been created to be. So just a, a few questions that we have. Um, and just to review uh, in, in our groups this week, um, don't, don't think about these things without thinking about the gospel. Right? Just hear me on that. Don't think about your gifts without thinking about the gospel. Don't think about your capacity to do these things without thinking about confession. Because it's only once in light of the gospel, it's only in light of the confession of our sin and, and, and a God who is ready to forgive that, that Nehemiah 10, 11, and 12 happen, right? And, and so maybe take some time in our groups this week and, and, and reread the yous in Nehemiah 9. The number, the, the, like what God is doing. Like so you are these things. And, and so what sticks out? And then maybe take some time in confession. Okay, right, and we, we talked about how uh, confession frees us up to move not just from, not just, okay, I'm, I'm forgiven of my sin, but I'm actually now walking with Jesus, and I'm identifying the roots uh, that, are, that are beneath that. Like, what's causing this behavior? What is the disbelief that's within my soul? And then just take some time to confess that, and then what, how, what are we doing in light of God's goodness? What are we doing in, in, in light of the fact that Jesus lives and dwells within us? Well, then, let's think about what are the, what are these apex gifts that you most naturally embody? And which ones you struggle with? And how does that inform the way that we view scripture and the mission of the church? Okay, because like, if, if you're apostolic, like every verse is about going out. And if you're a shepherd, every verse is about just sitting over coffee with somebody and having a long conversation, right? And so how do we think about that? How does it inform, how does it, how do, we, how do we start to think differently? And so what are, maybe there's some places where, where, where we need to repent because it's been more about our gifting and our preference than about grace and the person of Christ. And then just take some time to confess that in your group. And then maybe take some time to look around the room and, and, and just confirm and, and affirm in, in one another. Exercise affirming in one another their various giftings. Look and see, like, around the room. Because uh, you know, if, if you've been in a group with some people for a while, you've, you've probably seen some of this. Take some time to affirm in one another. Or maybe as, you know, wh when we're in the back and we're, we're heading around, maybe a and you're conversing with people, take some time to affirm in them, like, what it is that you see. Wha what, what ways do they, do they contribute to the body? So they would continue to do that more. Um, so what do we... What are we remembering? What, 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 what are we going to take away from, from today? That the Lord has shown great when his people participate. The Lord has shown great when his people participate. And, and so let's remind one another that you who are in Christ, all been created in the image of God, but you who are in Christ have his spirit within you. That as sons and daughters, we are to grow in full like likeness of who God is. We're to become mature. And so let's rejoice in the fact that Jesus is, has gone before us. That he has spoken the true words and invites us into deep and profound relationship with the Father. That he has shared the good news and he has gathered us together. That he is our great shepherd, uh, has, has stewarded and guarded and guided our soul. And that he teaches and gives us wise understanding in the ways to live and the ways to share more and more about who he is and what he's done, that we would all come together and that we could have the chocolate chips, the butter, the eggs, the flour, the baking soda, and the sprinkles. And I'm sorry that I don't have an easy bake oven. There won't be cake available at the end, but I did see some cookies back there. So let's stand and let's sing.